Welcome everyone to our webinar today. We are extremely excited to present Making Teletherapy a Viable and Long-Term Solution. We have some amazing presenters. I'll be introducing them to you today. We will be definitely um, well-fed with great content, great research, and some amazing specialists in the field. And I will go ahead and take five minutes or so doing an introduction. My name is Jeremy Glauser, and I'm the founder and CEO at eLuma. And we are very excited that you chose to register and learn more. Let me pull up our agenda for today. We will be um, obviously focusing mostly on making teletherapy a long-term and viable solution for schools and districts around the country and around the world, quite frankly. We have people registered from all over the country and in, in uh, other countries as well. We welcome you. We are going to be opening it up for a question and answer at the end of the webinar. There's a chat icon in the webinar room. It's a, it's a little circle. Click on the chat icon and you can put in questions that you would like to have answered later on in the webinar. So make sure you uh, type those out. We'll definitely get to as many as we possibly can with the time that we have. We will also be distributing a recording of this webinar. For those of you who are coming and attending live, can't stay the whole time, you'll get a copy of the recording, as well as all of you who registered and aren't able to make it here today. So again, thank you so much for coming. We, we love doing these webinars and presenting some really quality content for all of our special education and education colleagues out there. Let me give you a little bit of a background about eLuma. Um, we're sponsoring the webinar and putting this on, providing this opportunity. We as an organization are focused on solving problems in special education specifically. We do that by providing live online therapy solutions for speech, OT, and mental health. We have been around for seven years as an organization, and collectively we have centuries of experience in education itself. We have over 100 clinicians on the team delivering services to more than 4,000 students in 29 states. And uh, you know, we, we look forward to uh, a time and an opportunity to answer your questions and provide you with information as the occasion permits. But enough about Iluma. Let's really get on to the, the purpose for us coming here. I want to first uh, talk about to Mary Lynn. Mary Lynn, or Dr. Boscardine, uh, Mary Lynn and I met at a case conference. That's the Council of Administrators in Special Education um, a little while ago, and I would say we hit it off. Uh, Mary Lynn is doing some amazing things um, for the field and has dedicated her life to promoting the, the needs of, of children with disabilities and just education in general. And you can see some of her amazing credentials here, but she has served as the, the former president of CASE and is going to become the president of CEC or the acting president in January. Um, she is uh, currently working at UMass Amherst and has done some amazing research um, in leadership. Uh, Mary Lynn presented a webinar not too long ago and is back to give us some more insight. So thank you so much, Mary Lynn. It's a pleasure to have you here. I also want to welcome Dr. Andronopoulos to our webinar. She has a wonderful background in promoting different solutions and uh, producing different research that really drives the, the high standard of care for individuals who need it. And Mary and I have known each other for a short while, but I'm very impressed with, with her dedication to this field. And she has done some great things with Mary Lynn. And you can see a lot of it here on the screen, but a few highlights is that she has worked with the UMass Amherst for quite some time, doing quite a bit of research, heavily involved in the remote project that we'll be hearing more about today, which relates to training graduate students to become proficient in telepractice. And she has also participated in and developed 
many masters and doctoral training programs and uh, specifically with the, a population including children with ASD. And, you know, she has done uh, a great number of, of work in this field. A lot of research that is out there has Dr. Andrianopoulos' name all over it. And we want to say thank you for being here and helping deliver wonderful content that is going to contribute to educating many, many individuals about telepractice in special education. So at this point, what I would like to do is I'd like to turn it over to uh, the two of you, Dr. Andronopoulos and Dr. Boscardin. Why don't you go ahead and take it away? Okay. Um, welcome. We are opening this webinar with a quote from Brown, which is on the next this slide, yes, uh, who stated, telepractice is not a different service, but rather a different method of service delivery. This method of service delivery, like all services, has processes and procedures that ensure fidelity. It is these processes and procedures that we will share with you today. And another note I want to make is we refer to it as telepractice because it represents more broadly both the process of assessment and the process of therapy. Next. Our agenda for today includes discussion of the definition of telepractice, approaches to telepractice, implementation of telepractice that includes setup logistics, and do's and don'ts of telepractice therapy, uh, incorporating evidence-based practices, stakeholder involvement, and long-term considerations. What is telepractice? Telepractice is the application of telecommunications technology for the delivery of speech language pathology and audiology professional services at a distance by linking clinician to client, patient, or clinician to clinician for assessment, intervention, and or consultation. Telepractice has proliferated in the past five years, especially in the speech language pathology and audiology professions. Approximately four years ago, the Special Interest Group 18 was organized by the American Speech Language Hearing Association, or ASHA, to provide speech language pathologists, or SLPs, or, or, and audiologists information in a venue to learn more about the role and implementation of telepractice. Next. There are three types of approaches to telepractice that we have used to provide services. Synchronous, asynchronous and hybrid. We recognize that there are other types of approaches such as blended, but our focus will be on those which we have implemented. We will discuss each of these three approaches in the following slides. What is not okay to talk about and say to others, we should avoid and appropriate conversations um, with others because it can make them feel sad or uncomfortable. Good job. Okay, rule number three. Wait your turn and do not interrupt. Can you read this for me? Interrupt. As the slot. Interrupting makes people feel sad. Mm -hmm. They might they might feel like you don't have their, don't value their words. Mm -hmm. So this is a question. Have you ever been interrupted? Yeah, that's my question for you. Have you ever been interrupted? Yeah. You have? How did it make you feel? Sad. Sad, exactly. People don't like to be interrupted. Mm -hmm. Okay, so conversations go back and forth, kind of like this picture here. So you need to always wait your turn. Um, you can't even um, go in the seesaw with three guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the seesaw can only be up or down at one time. Mm -hmm. As you saw in this slide, the synchronous approach is live and interactive with audio and video delivered on a video conference platform. The specialist and client are present at the same time in real time, but they are not in the same room. They may be in the same building, school district, or off campus in a remote location in state, out of state, and even in a different country with respect to the client. 
but they are video conferencing at the same time in real time. Um, in the video that you just saw, the clinician is in the teleconferencing office and the client is a student enrolled in the district in the same state. Um, the, mo the monitor showed a segment of the student's lesson plan based on their IEP goals and objectives. Um, this student um, is on the autism spectrum. In the next slide, we are going to um, discuss the asynchronous approach, and that's going to be followed by a short video. Thinking about. He is standing really close to me. Which, can you circle which person he's thinking about? I'm going to give you the mouse. Good, he's thinking about him. How is the boy in the glasses feeling? Mad. Is he mad because the boy is too close to him? Yeah. Nice job. How would you feel if somebody was standing too close to you? The asynchronous approach, as you just observed, is, is an approach that utilizes a store and forward type of consultation. Radiologists use this approach in medicine to read x-rays and other imaging studies obtained on patients at a different facility. In the video that you just saw, the graduate clinician is recording her therapy session using an external peripheral camera while she's providing language therapy to her student on the autism spectrum using telepractice in real time. The graduate cl clinician is capturing and going to store her session in a secure digital file format, which she can review by by herself and with her supervisor at a later date to critique her intervention session. The digital file can also be forwarded to the student's teacher or the administrator at the school district for review and for student progress monitoring. Um, the student with whom um, the, the graduate clinician was working is also on the autism spectrum and um, had a monotone, mono pitch sounding voice. Um, this was not a distorted signal. In the next slide, um, we're going to discuss the hybrid model. The hybrid model includes both synchronous, live, real-time interactive video conferencing and store and forward or asynchronous consultation capabilities. Examples of hybrid approaches include remote monitoring, distance supervision, active consultation, student, clinician, and parent garden training, training. The hybrid model is not limited to a single communication channel. The advantage of the hybrid model is that it allows one to use all technologies to diagnose, provide intervention or conferencing, consultation with the client, team, and or parents or guardians. This picture illustrates a speech language pathologist providing supervision to a graduate clinician on the remote end on how to facilitate communication to a client who is nonverbal using an AAC device. Um, the client's movements and selection of icons on their AAC device are being pr projected and recorded on the second monitor for future review, analysis, and clinician parent training. Next slide. Um, what we'd like to do with you is talk a little bit about uh, shortages. As with all special education and related services, there is a documented critical shortage of service providers. An additional 28,900 SLPs will be needed nationally to fill the demand in the next decade. Employment of SLPs will grow by 21% from 2014 to 2024, and 25,400 jobs will open before 2026. In 2017, there were more funded or budgeted job openings that remained unfilled, more so in rural and suburban areas than in urban areas. Next. As we can see in the last line of this table, SLPs overall are at critical shortage. Next. While 17 states are identified as having SLP shortages, we believe all states have pockets where shortages exist. 
Thus, the need is underestimated and much greater. Telepractice offers opportunities to not only address these shortages and provide mandated services as required by IDEA, but reduce travel time and the cost associated with travel, increase supervision and consultation time, and offer alternate ways to provide training and professional development. We will now consider how to best implement telepractice. There are five considerations, space, budget, broadband, security, and network fire, firewall. Although many companies offer video teleconferencing capabilities for a fee, not all teleconferencing platforms are HIPAA and FERPA compliant. Even though some video teleconferencing companies provide secure transmission of data, they are not liable for the management of the data or any breaches in security or of confidential information on the transmission or receiving end. Confidentiality must be preserved at all times. Because speech-language pathology is both a medical profession and educational service, HIPAA and FERPA must be respected at all times. This means using a secure connection and using computers that are not connect connected to a general server. Basic Skype does not qualify as a secure connection. Other considerations for telepractice um, include the hardware, software, and site specification. The, the specific type of host computer for telepractice with respect to its RAM, speed of the processor, and operating system need to be taken into consideration. A web camera and its frames per second capture rate is another consideration. At least one large monitor is necessary to present materials that appear on the monitor, which also needs to be controlled for screen clutter. A second monitor provides the telepractitioner greater opportunities to utilize two screens for sharing materials conveniently and or to capture two signals at the same time. A head-mounted headset is strongly recommended. A surge protector and an in-room telephone for troubleshooting problems with connectivity are also basic equ equipment needed for telepractice. Other considerations for implementing telepractice include the bandwidth or speed of the internet connection, which may significantly vary and should meet specific hardware, software, and transmission requirements. The telepractitioner must determine the minimal requirements for internet bandwidth frame rate of, of the host computer and camera to best accommodate the type of service to be provided, the type of data or high definition video to be transmitted between outbound and inbound streams, including the number of participants or attend attendees signed into the same session at the same time, as well as other factors. The site location and the acoustic environment should be controlled for sound absorption. A white noise generator placed outside of the teleconferencing room is recommended for confidentiality. Because not everyone can benefit from telepractice, ASHA developed a position in 2015 that put forth the caveat that not all students or clients are good candidates for receiving services via telepractice. It is important to know who, when telepractice is, an efficacious approach for service delivery. We have identified several factors that impact an individual's ability to benefit from telepractice services. We start with physical and sensory characteristics, which include tactile, kinesthetic, and sensory abilities. Cognitive, behavioral, and or motivational characteristics include the ability to maintain attention and sit in front of the camera. Communication characteristics are speech intelligibility and cultural or linguistic variables or considerations. Support resources include availab availability of technology and the appropriate environment. 
next. Um, in addition to client student readiness, implementing effective services via telepractice depend on professional readiness of service providers. The first level of readiness for service providers is meeting the certification requirements of ASHA. The second level is meeting licensure requirements for each state in which SLPs offer telepractice. All because an SLP might deliver services in a location in a state different from the state where the student or client is receiving services does not necessarily mean SLPs are waived from state licensure requirements where the services are being delivered. The same holds true for many other professionals, such as engineers, doctors, nurses, and lawyers practicing in multiple states. It is important to be knowledgeable of state laws regarding licensing. Next. Since 2012, Project Remote, supported by the U.S. Department of Education, Office of Special Education Programs Personal Preparation Grants, it's a grant that Mary Lynn and I received from the U.S. DOE, has prepared 44 master students in speech language pathology to deliver speech and language services using telepractice. The training program includes six additional course credit hours and two semesters of supervised practicum experiences to learn how to create and deliver SLP services via telepractice. These additional requirements are completed concurrently with the core requirements for earning a master's degree in speech language pathology at UMass Amherst. In this slide, we are going to describe the remote telepractice training program, which involves five steps. In step one, personnel need to be educated and trained on the appropriate use of telepractice, its benefits, limitations, and troubleshooting technological and other problems. Step two includes training procedures, such as reviewing ASHA's professional telepractice portals, conducting an environmental assessment for on-site and off-site locations, learning about the Common Core State Standards Project and other federal and state policies under IDEA, training using the video conferencing software, selecting and designing appropriate media to be used for lesson plans delivered via telepractice such as smart notebook software and smart classroom tutorials. Mock consultation and therapy sessions are also completed. Step three includes methods for data collection. We follow single subject design protocols, visual graphing and other specific data collection methods. Step four includes assessing the graduate clinician's acquisition of the core competencies for using telepractice. And lastly, step five includes collecting consumer, client, and stakeholder satisfaction surveys. Project Remote prepares graduate student clinicians using a set of 48 competencies organized under four domains. Regulatory knowledge, technical skills, connecting and digital management, and interpersonal skills. Regulatory knowledge includes scope of practice, understanding copyright, intellectual, and material licensing laws. Technical skills include scheduling, creation of digital materials, and desktop sharing. Connecting and digital management includes problem solving on the local computer, and managing privacy and confidentiality. Interpersonal skills involve rapport, roles, and responsibilities of therapists, and need an ability to communicate rationale for providing telepractice services. Our experience with startup training for our remote scholars ranges from a minimum of nine hours to a maximum of 24 hours of practicum time with a mean of 18 hours. The chart in front of you displays the average time it takes to achieve the 48 competencies within four domains for each of our clinicians that we train.
The use of telepractice must be specified in an approved IEP as the method for service delivery. If delivered through a clinic or hospital or privately, permission will need to be obtained from the parent or guardian. It is important for parents to know how services are being delivered and the qualifications of the individual who physically will be, in their, be with their child during the delivery of those services. All personnel involved in the telepractice program need to be prepared on how to troubleshoot problems and navigate the televideo conferencing platform, both on-site and off-site, and practice and conduct mock video conferencing sessions. We have found that the number of hours, uh, the number of hours training for on-site for on-site and off-site personnel varies pending clinician experience using technology and their comfort level. IDEA requires the use of scientifically based or evidence-based practices whenever possible. This includes any intervention that is delivered via telepractice or face-to-face. Often telepractice is confused as being an evidence-based practice. Telepractice and face-to-face -face are modes of delivery. They are not an evidence-based practice. It's the actual intervention that makes up the evidence-based practice. Our research data uh, our research over the past five years at UMass Amher Amherst um, has studied a total of 30 students on the autism spectrum ranging in grade from eight, from grade eight in elementary, 20 in middle school, and two in high school, all of whom received SLP intervention services via telepractice as compared to services delivered on site over the course of one academic year. As previously stated, the intervention services were provided by the 44 student, graduate student clinicians who were being trained with a specialization in telepractice. Our outcome data show no meaningful difference between SLP services delivered to students on the autism spectrum using telepractice or on-site service, service delivery methods. However, despite fluctuations in the data between telepractice versus on-site phases, students with ASD showed improvement across both phases, yet some students were more variable, but not practically or significantly data uh, different. Our data also showed that some students with ASD perform better on their IEP goals and objectives using telepractice compared to on-site, since they were more focused, required fewer reinforcers and prompting. This graph shows one student's progress during speech language therapy over 15 weeks five weeks using telepractice, followed by five weeks on site, then returning to five weeks using telepractice. Please note that the black lines at the top reflect percent accuracy on this student's IEP goal number one. The red line towards the bottom of the graph is percent assistance, such as prompting. Jeremy, can you return to the previous slide? Thanks. Um, the other part of this slide is um, what we have found that although the majority of students with ASD re receiving SLP services via telepractice show no meaningful difference between mode of delivery, in other words, telepractice versus on site, and that the required less assistance, as Mary said before, using telepractice. Um, it's also important to note on this slide that some students with ASD perform better on their IEP goals, as mentioned previously, and their IEP objectives using telepractice compared to on-site, since they were more, as Mary indicated, they were more focused and required fewer reinforcers for prompting. Okay. An option available to all programs is to request students to participate in a user-friendly 
Satisfaction Survey. On screen, you will see a survey that we used with our young students with ASD. The items were read to the students and then they were asked to point to one of the faces that responded to their experiences. As you can see, the faces ranged from happy to neutral to sad. Next. Here's another example where students with ASD actually provide a written response. As you can see, this student really enjoyed receiving SLP services via telepractice. As can be seen in this slide, the satisfa satisfaction surveys among a cohort of 10 students with autism spectrum disorder receiving speech language pathology services via telepractice compared to on-site equally liked both service delivery models with the exception of one student who did not like speech therapy at all, whether it was delivered via telepractice or on-site. Who are our stakeholders? Examples of stakeholders include teachers, special educators, therapists, administrators, families or guardians, community members, regional and state education agencies, local and state social service agencies. We rely on stakeholders to promote, communicate, and invest in telepractice. However, this can only occur when telepractice is applied appropriately. The involvement of stakeholders broadens the understanding of what telepractice is and is not. Stakeholder participation through various activities creates ongoing support contributing to improved outcomes. With respect to um, long-term considerations, IDEA is very clear that with any intervention, costs cannot be a factor when developing an IEP. Regarding reimbursement, some states have authorized reimbursement for Medicaid. With respect to Medicare, some telemedicine providers are reimbursed. However, SLPs and audiologists are not eligible providers under Medicare. Third-party payer reimbursement by private health insurance companies is determined on a case-by-case -case basis. States need to pass legislation mandating coverage of telepractice. As can be seen in the next slide, less than half the states in the United States um, approve the use of Medicaid reimbursement for telepractice. Everyone is encouraged to review the laws for their states regarding Medicaid reimbursement for SLP and audiology telepractice services. So, in conclusion, it is critical when preparing to deliver telepractice services that hardware, software, and site selection meet the standards for service delivery. Pre-training in telepractice of speech language pathologists is necessary to ensure efficacy in service delivery. Not all clients are candidates for interventions delivered via telepractice. All interventions should be evidence-based and appropriate for delivery in a telepractice environment. Involving stakeholders from the very beginning is important to the success of telepractice. Lastly, we would like to thank you for sharing your time with us today. We're ha we are happy to answer any questions you might have for us now. Um, otherwise, after the webinar, feel free to contact us at the emails we have provided in this slide. Wonderful. I'm going to leave this slide up a little bit longer in case people want to jot down a note with those, those emails and that contact information. Dr. Andronopoulos and Dr. Boscardino just want to say thank you so much for coming prepared with findings and with information that really is, is uh, very educational to many of us. There's 
there's still a lot of education that we need to do for for uh, for all of our friends and, and education related related to telepractice. And I think that this does a great job of moving that needle. We do have some questions in the chat, so I'd like to take some of those questions that have been coming in. One of the common questions that we've received is, are we going to distribute a copy of this PowerPoint? And the answer is, we're distributing a copy of the, uh, sorry, a recording link to the webinar, as well as the slide deck. It's going to be a slightly revised version of the slide deck because we cannot distribute the videos themselves, but we can distribute the still slides and the static slides. All right, so other than that question, I think we have a few that we might need to explore a little bit. So the first question we got here is, could you re-explain the hybrid approach? I didn't quite understand the slide and explanation. So why don't I do this? Why don't I go back through here very quickly and get us to that point of the hybrid? Sure. Um, oh, that, that's the asynchronous sure. one. The hybrid. Um, the hybrid is a combination. It includes both synchronous, which is real-time interactive um, conferencing, and a store and forward or asynchronous um, model. And, and includes also consultation capabilities. Um, one way, um, one, if you um, study the literature, the um, group that has been using this model very effectively and has um, data to support its efficacy is um, um, Vismara and colleagues and Rogers who are training parents of very young children who are delayed in developing speech and language therapy and they're training not only the graduate student clinicians but the parents on how to utilize the early start Denver model to facilitate communication in young children. So they have um, several pre-recorded um, sessions or demonstrations along with um, intervention materials online, but then at the same time they're training the they're training the clinicians to train the parents in real time on how to utilize these materials appropriately. Um, so they're doing it in real time, but accessing the, the materials that are recorded and they can store and forward to them. Um, the way in which we have utilized it at UMass um, is to train parents on how to facilitate communication on nonverbal children um, who are using um, AAC devices. Uh, in this picture, the doctoral student is training a clinician in real time on site um, while the, who is teaching the, 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 the student, the nonverbal student to use an AAC device. The clinician, the supervisor on site, the doctoral student is recording what's happening, which she'll later review with the um, graduate clinician whom she's training, which can also be reviewed with the parents who need to follow the same procedures. So that recording will use as a tool. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Perfect. Looks like you got a thumbs up, Mary. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you for doing that. Um, another question is about the participants in some of the in this remote project, and and the question is, are services provided by graduate students only are, or are SLPs available? That's a good question. Um, because we are um, trying to demonstrate the efficacy of using a telepractice service delivery model, um, we follow strict um, controlled conditions. Our objective under this grant is to train graduate students, graduate clinicians who are earning a master's degree in speech language pathology to learn how to use technologies effectively, effectively specifically telepractice, given the shortage of SLPs in, in the nation. So we are training graduate clinicians. Um, we are also training on-site personnel um, on how to engage in telepractice. Um, with the clinician in the, on the remote end. And um, then our graduate students go on and um, earn their degree in a specialization in telepractice. And then they go on and start programs or um, integrate a telepractice platform at, 
at their school district or where they um, um, choose to work post-graduation. So we are training graduate students, but we do work with um, SLPs who are certified and licensed and know how to conduct telepractice or engage in telepractice on the um, receiving end. Perfect. All right. We do have a question coming in. Um, Brenda, looks like you're raising your hand here to ask a question. Unfortunately, we can't broadcast the audio, but if you can put your question into the chat. So if you hover your mouse over this Zoom classroom screen, there's an icon at the bottom of the Zoom classroom screen that uh, will say chat or look like a chat bubble. Click on that and it will uh, give you a spot to type your question in. I apologize, but uh, that is the only option for, for posing a question. Uh, let's see, we've got another question here. Um, who would generate the IEP goals, the district's SLP or the telepractitioner? And I think it would be great for um, either one of you to answer this, but if I may just uh, give a, a short answer at the beginning as well, I think this is going to uh, depend on the, the school process and some of the decisions made at the school level. I'll have to say that most of the time um, SLPs are going to act much like the SLPs uh, or OTs or other providers that are on site. So if they are, they'll have access to the IEP management system, they'll be able to log in and update goals and generate progress reports, and they will be able to attend meetings, uh, usually through video conference or through phone. Much of the collaboration in that way is um, slightly different because they're remote, but they would perform many of the same functions as your on-site SLP. All right. Right. Mary, um, Mary, what, I, what I'll, add? I'll follow up on what you said, Jeremy. You're absolutely right. Um, and it, remember, we're function IEPs are developed with as with team members, so you can identify any number of people to be part of an IEP team. And part of the reason a district might not be using, it might not, uh, it might be using, let me rephrase that, might be using telepractice is because they don't have an SLP. So you would certainly want to find a way for the telepractitioner who would be providing the SLP services to be included in the team meeting, whether it be audio visually or just through audio of some sort. Um, uh, that would be, you know, there's, there are many options for doing that. So, um, I, but ideally you'll, you will have district, the appropriate district personnel, as well as the speech and language therapist involved in that team meeting, because you want everybody on the same page, uh, working toward the six, working so the student can have every opportunity to succeed. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and one of the things that, that uh, you pointed out in this PowerPoint is that there are varying, various stakeholders involved in the telepractice program, whether it is synchronous, asynchronous, or hybrid. And, and it is important to note that there's, quote unquote, e-helper or a facilitator who is um, a person physically on site who acts as uh, a quasi liaison between uh, for different purposes and so mostly their responsibilities are limited when it comes to the telepractice program but a few of them do include turning on the computer um, opening up the video conferencing platform and then one of them relates to this whole IEP meeting uh, <coughs> concept and that is maybe sending home notices to families because they can print and send those home. So in most cases it's relatively limited but there are some key things that an, uh, a facilitator or e-helper needs to help do on site at the building. The other thing I would add to that is when you ask who would generate the IEP goals, hopefully it's done collaboratively with the team, with the parents, uh, with the speech and language pathologist, with the classroom teacher. I've seen classroom teachers 
generate speech and language goals. I have had parents come into IEP meetings with speech and language goals for their child. So it's really a collaborative uh, process. I, I just want to jump in since um, much of um, the work we do also includes training graduate clinicians who will go on and become practitioners. Um, an IEP is, is like a contract. Um, you don't deviate from the goals and objectives that are outlined unless the IEP changes. So um, we work with the goals and objectives that are um, in place in the current IEP. Another consideration consideration um, for selecting who is a good candidate is you need to determine whether that student is an appropriate candidate for telepractice. Um, so that's something that needs to be taken into consideration as well, um, regardless of what the IEP goals and objectives um, say. And also informing the parents and getting their approval that um, SLP services will be delivered by telepractice. Um, so, so that's a consideration as well. Looks like we have another question coming in. Is there the capability for a student or to rewatch a session later? If you record it, yes. And I think that absolutely, and I think that might depend on whatever platform you're using to conduct or receive telepractice, different capabilities, but you still need to ensure sure that the recording is HIPAA and FERPA compliant. Yeah. And sometimes there are systems that offer recording, but that recording is stored in the cloud, so to speak. And you do need to make sure that if you do uh, take advantage of that functionality, that you're maintaining the same level of privacy. Yeah, I, I'm really glad that Jeremy brought that up because HIPAA and FERPA and security um, compliance is essential. And there are several levels of that. Not only the signal, the, the, the transmission of the data, but um, ensuring that HIPAA and FERPA compliance is um, being implemented at the, the end that is generating or is delivering the services and the receiving end, the storing of the um, data and the storing, the storage of the student's IEP if the clinician on the remote end is working with a student at the school district, and then any recordings need to be stored as well. So there are several levels of um, compliance, um, not just the transmission of the signal. Right. Let's see here. It says, there's another question. Do you have a list of... Who do telepractice? Well, I don't, um, I, um, I don't think that's the scope of this presentation <laughs> um, to provide a list of practitioners. Um, but um, I... I wonder if you can comment to that well, effect, Jeremy. Well, yeah, maybe what I can do is I think what's most important when you are looking into doing teletherapy is, is that you take into consideration what you've heard today. And if you're new to this, it's going to feel a little bit daunting. So I would say you probably want to work with someone or some organization who has done this enough to take the anxiety and stress out of the equation. If you're more experienced and you're thinking we want to hire some someone uh, like like uh, Mary and Mary Lynn have suggested they're training graduate students to go on and and work in school districts as a telepractitioner. Let's say you hire an individual, you will have to take into consideration the technology and their experience, their ability to help with tech support and look at it collectively or as a whole. Um, with many of the great points made today. So that would be my, that would be my perspective on it. But it's, I mean, it's probably pretty biased for, for us to sit here and, and for me to say Iluma, I would, of course, we would recommend Iluma, but we recommend that you, you do your research and that you understand what you're getting into. And that oftentimes means that you, you uh, reach out to some trusted sources, uh, do your homework, but my last thought there is 
as of today, in this current environment within education um, or even medical, you're not typically hiring an individual practitioner to do telepractice. You're going to be working with, an, with some organization or clinic, or maybe it's a university like UMass Amherst who does it versus an individual. Uh, I, I, I think um, experience, capability, reliability, and track record are important um, considerations when selecting a, a telepractitioner. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It looks like our questions are starting to uh, slow down a little bit. So what I'm going to do is take the opportunity and remind everyone that we will be distributing a link to the recording of this webinar, and we will also distribute a revised version of the slide deck presented today. We want to thank you all so very much for registering and attending. Uh, we had a very, very good response to the topic, and we had a great turnout, which is, is great to know because we want to continue sponsoring and putting on these free webinars. Our goal, I think, um, my goal, our goal as a team, Mary and Mary Lynn's goal is to help educate and, uh, and inform as many people as we can about telepractice and how it can work and why it can work. So if you have any questions, you, you've been provided the contact information for both Mary Lynn and Mary. We, you'll also have contact information for Iluma and we would love to uh, do any follow-up and answer any questions as a result. So thank you so much, everyone. We are going to end it there and call it a webinar. Have a great day and a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you.